Hey everyone, we're so glad that you've tuned in for this message today. I believe God gave me a word for you and I believe the word of God is going to bring you strength. I believe God's going to bring someone comfort and take someone to a new level. I want you to watch this message that the Lord gave me and at the end, I'm gonna come back and we're gonna pray for you. God bless you, enjoy this word. I wanna to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter four and I want to preach today on um, a challenging subject and not one that, you know, that I just run to. Uh, in fact, the pastors will tell you I've been talking in pastors meeting about this for several months. I have felt uh, like this was coming and I felt like today was the day God wanted me to teach this message and preach this message. There are times when we exhort, there are times when we encourage, there are times when we build and strengthen as pastors and that is the grace and the anointing and the call on a pastor's life. There are also times as a man or woman of God that you use the word of the Lord to instruct and even warn. We don't like those sermons because they often confront and challenge the thing in us that we think that we have hidden. But the reality of it is you, you and I had nothing from God. And God sees all and knows all. And how many are grateful that he loves us enough to put his finger on the thing in us, in all of us individually. He puts that, that, that one thing under his light and he reveals it not to shame, but to bring freedom. And today there will be no shame in this house. There is no shame in Christ, but I do feel and have felt in prayer all week long that God wanted to bring some light on some things in our hearts and he wants to help us to, um, to go forward in freedom. And so today I'm gonna to talk about sexual purity. And I'm gonna talk about it because the world is talking about it and the church has gotten largely silent about it. And because we don't talk about it, the enemy fills in the blanks. And so what I want to do today is just, I, I want to talk, talk about protecting purity. Everyone say protecting purity. Yeah, and so we're going to talk about protecting purity. It's something each of you have. It's something each of you should want. And if you feel like you've lost sexual purity, I want to tell you it's something that by the grace of God, you can recapture. So there's hope in Christ. How many know that that's good news today? I want to read from the Passion Translation, and I want to read eight verses, the first eight verses of the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians. If they'll put that on the screen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 through 8 in the Passion Translation. Let's read this together. And now, beloved brothers and sisters, come on, read with me. Since you have been mentored by us with respect to living for God and pleasing Him, I appeal to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ with this request. Keep faithfully growing through our teachings even more and more. For you already know the instructions that we've shared with you through the Lord Jesus. God's will, everybody say God's will. I hear people all the time saying, what is God's will for my life? This is about as simple and most complete definition of it as you will find in the whole New Testament. Read this with me. God's will is for you to be set apart for him in holiness. Man, that's a sermon all by itself. God's will is for you and I to be set apart to him, for him in holiness, and that you keep yourselves unpolluted from sexual defilement. Yes, each of you must guard your sexual purity with holiness and dignity not yielding to lustful passions like those who do not know God. Never take selfish advantage of a brother or sister in this matter. For we've already told you and solemnly warned you that the Lord is the avenger in all these things. For God's call on our lives is not to live a life of compromise and perversion, but to a life surrounded in holiness. Therefore, whoever rejects this instruction is not rejecting human authority, but God himself, who gives us his precious gift, his spirit of holiness. How many are thankful for the Holy Spirit, the gift that he is? Amen. 
Lord, this is your word. It is heavy, and yet we have to hear it and receive it. So give me the grace to teach it, give them the grace to receive it. And I pray today that before this service is over, you would break in this teaching and that a moment of healing and restoration can come for those who need this word today. I release grace over this house. I bind the voice of condemnation. I bind in the name of the Lord Jesus, the voice of shame. And I pray now that grace would flow like a massive torrential river through this house, right? Woo, thank you, Lord. Grace would flow like a river and set captive people free. In the name of Jesus, amen. Be seated. So, there are different lenses through which we perceive and understand different subjects and different generations approach different subject in multiple ways. And some people today in this room are glad I'm talking about this because they need help and others are like, why would I come to church and my pastor talk about sexual purity? Let me tell you why. Because the church, as I said a moment ago, has become very silent regarding this issue and Satan has become very loud and we have a lot of confused people coming to churches. And the reason there is confusion is because no one, well, let me say it this way, many people are embracing various kinds of reports and have called various things the truth regarding sexual purity. I want you to understand this morning that if your conversation and if my conversation and if my teaching and what I believe about purity and sexuality, if it doesn't start and end with the Bible, I expose myself immediately to grave error. I expose myself immediately to, to the possibility and the likelihood of being deceived. If you're getting your cues from this carnal culture about what sexuality really is, you are already in trouble. If, if, if you and I are consulting the love doctors of our generation who share wives and flop spout, flip flop with other spouses and do all kinds of other crazy things, if that's who is giving us our cues, we in the church are already in trouble. And it, it, it's something that um, as a pastor, um, you, you, you want to help people, you want to see people walk in freedom, you want them to see them walk in the light, and, and, and that has happened so many times, and yet so many times I've seen the struggles that believers have with walking a pure life before God. And some people would tell you that just because it's been a struggle, you get, you get to come to a place where you're like, you know what, I don't even care anymore. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna acquiesce and give over to the, the pressure. I'm gonna acquiesce and give over to the lust that I've been fighting. It's just who I am. I want you to understand right now that faith is what keeps you in the fight against sin. I don't care how many times you fall, never let your failure become your identity as it regards sexual purity. Never allow your failure or your falling to become your identity. I don't care how many times you fall, make up your mind that it's not who I am, I'm getting back up in the name of the Lord. And I wanna tell you today, Jesus wants you to get back up. And he wants you to get back in the fight and he wants you to get your eyes back on him and he wants you to keep running the race and he wants you to set aside the stuff that keeps easily besetting you as he said in the book of Hebrews. And today I just, I just feel like a couple of things. I feel like we need to talk about protecting purity and, and, and how we do that. And it's all right here and it's really just these three points and I'm gonna give them to you and I pray the Lord would speak through them to your heart today. Number one, some of us have to get back to respecting purity. If you're gonna protect purity, you gotta respect purity. This is what I would call the truth. Everybody say the truth. Now, it is God, and we need to make sure we get this this morning, it is God who established sex and sexuality. Sex did not come from demons or devils. 
Like everything else God created, the enemy takes the pure intent of the creation and he pollutes it, contaminates it, and twists it into something that is damaging and harmful to humanity. Sex came from God. Sexuality came from God. Watch this. Sexuality is the identification of what you are. Sex is the act of engaging in that identity. Let me break it down like this. Male and female is sexuality. That's who they are. Sex is what they do. Sexuality is male and female. And, and, and I, I think I've said this before in this pulpit, but in the world that we're living in, you probably can't say it enough. If you were born with a penis, you are a male. If you are born with a vagina, you are a female. It is not until recently that that was a discussion. Not until recently was that an option. You were born in your mother and through your mother's womb the way God intended for you to be. Don't, I, I, I'm not trying to create like sides. I'm trying to make sure confused people understand there was no confusion in the mind of God. He gave you the apparatus you needed to be what he called you to be. And you don't have to wake up one morning and believe that your father in heaven made a mistake. He created you exactly. There are no mistakes with God. None. You have what you need to be who God called you to be. And you have what you need to do what God called you to do. Well, pastor, I have these feelings. No, what, what's happening is we are living in a culture that is creating confusion and questions and the questions are not going answered by truth. So the enemy will take a, oh, Jesus here. The enemy will take um, the presentation of confusion and speak to you and tell people they are confused. When in reality, God made it so easy. All you have to do is, never mind. You just know. Truth sets us free. I'm gonna keep walking down this path about respecting truth, or respecting purity. Because the truth is that there are as many people who are heterosexual in sin, more so probably than the people that are in the church bashing those who are in the homosexual community. Is homosexuality a sin? Please zoom in and hear me very carefully. This Bible reveals clearly that homosexuality is a sin, but this Bible also reveals that it is immoral for heterosexual people to sleep around like a bunch of rabbits. And while you champion one sin as greater than the other, both are damning the soul. And there are people who bash other Christians who are dealing with and struggling with a sin that they themselves are not bashing, not knowing that the sin that they are trying to cover up by magnifying the sin of someone else. In fact, Jesus would say it like this, if you're going to get rid of the brother's toothpick in his eye, get rid of the telephone pole in your eye. The truth is that we are to live sanctified lives. We don't talk about sanctification anymore in the church. Growing up, the testimony was, I am saved, I am sanctified, you got to do that, and I am filled with the Holy Ghost. Today, we're just saved. And all we did was get a get out of hell free card, and we ran down and put our name on a church roll, and if you don't get sanctified, then you don't ever become everything God wanted you to be. And I'm not sure some people who think they're saved are really saved. I'm not being critical and I'm not trying to cause 
over inspection of one's own life. I'm telling you what Paul said. Try yourself to make sure you're in the faith. And if you're truly in the faith, then there's going to be fruit that reveals a life that has turned from sin and turned to God. Say amen, church. Now let me teach sanctification for three minutes. When Paul said it is the will of God, can you put that scripture on the, on the screen please, Chad? It is the will of God for you to be sanctified. There's no wondering or questioning if that promise and that commandment are yours. It is God's will. Well, who am I going to marry? I don't know, but I know this. It is God's will. Well, where am I going to get a job? I don't know, but I'm going to tell you this. It is God's will for you to live a sanctified life. Sanctified, don't miss it. Because growing up in my childhood, I would not take anything for how I was raised. But sometimes, for many of us who were raised in holiness churches, sanctification was one-sided. Don't miss it. And it was this, run from sin. Sanctification is not just set apart from the world. It is that. It is not just set apart from sin. It is that. Sanctification, however, is set apart from so that I can be fully set unto Jesus. If all you do is run from sin, but don't run to Jesus, you will inevitably run back to sin. Sin is not defeated by your willpower. Sin is defeated by intimacy with the one who broke the power of sin over your life. You can't just hate sin. You gotta love Jesus more than you love anything else. And when you do, he takes the desire for sin out of you and he puts a heart for more of him in you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? This is sanctification. If every time you're tempted, you give in to the sin, I don't wanna make you mad, but I'm gonna tell you what the book says. If you love him, you will keep his commandments. If you love him, you don't give in to the flesh over and over and over. And the way to keep from giving in to the flesh is to spend time in the spirit. The truth, everybody say respecting purity. Can I just say it like this? Want it. Dear Lord, want purity. You ought to desire it. Well, you know, Bishop, I don't know. I don't know about all this. I want to be culturally relevant. I need to have partners. You're asking for diseases. Can't handle this. Can't handle this in the church. You're, you're asking for misery. You're asking for regret. You're a, you, say, you say, oh, but no, pastor. I just, I'm supposed to be free. That is not freedom. That is bondage. Since when did holiness become bondage and lasciviousness and sin become freedom? Jesus came to set me. See, this is, the, this is the lie of the enemy. The lie of the enemy is, let me show you what freedom looks like. Go do whatever you want. That's freedom. When Jesus says the exact, exact opposite, he doesn't say go do whatever you want to do. Sin as much as you want to sin and call that freedom. He said sin is the slave master. See, we got this wrong in the church. Sin is not your friend. Sin is the slave master. And the enemy deceives us into believing that we get what we want and we do what we want and that is freedom. Nothing could be further from the truth. That is bondage because sin has a penalty called death. 
And although you do it and don't die immediately, you think that just because you got away with it, God is okay with it. Run from sin and run to Jesus. Well, I don't like this kind of teaching. I want someone to give me seven steps to happiness. We are miserable. Sin is kicking your tail. You're not happy. You're miserable. And if you can go to a church and they make you feel comfortable in your sin, sin, put your Reeboks on and run from it. Run, run, run. Don't you sit there and let some false prophet tell you God wants you to sin as much as you can and see how much you can get away with. It's a lie. Oh God, I'm going old fashioned, old school right here. But it is a lie and it... It'll bring you misery. Lord Jesus, help me. Respect purity. Respect it. We live in the same kind of culture the Thessalonians lived in. We live in the same kind of godless culture that the Corinthians lived in. You shouldn't preach on this. Tell Paul that. The only way to correct this mess and fix this mess is to expose it and tell the truth about it. You don't have to be mean and you don't have to be condemning and you don't have to beat people up. But you have to preach the truth. Say respect it. Respect purity. I, 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 wanna, I don't want to insult your intelligence, but I want to tell you this. And I'm going to, it, there's no way for me to talk about this and it not turn into something else. And it, I just have to accept it's going to be cut and pasted. And godless people are going to make fun of it. And while you're doing it, let me smile and give you a pose. Okay, so there, let me just bless you and love you. If you're gonna do it, get the best side of me right here. Hard part, yeah, okay. I wish there was a way to have this conversation and to preach this kind of message and it not feel like those who are on the other side of receiving this feel like an enemy, because you're not an enemy. You're not hopeless, and you're not so marred and messed up that God wouldn't love you. But we live in a culture that has made it more than just acceptable. the agenda is actually being pushed upon us. And I'm not mad that they're expressing their freedom. I'm mad that they're trying to turn their freedom into our bondage. I don't agree with the premise or the, the statements of the LGBTQ Plus, whatever letter's next, and I honestly don't know. I, I'm, 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 not, I'm not here to say I agree with it, but I can actually say if that's what you want to do, I believe it's sin, I believe it's wrong, but if that's what you're going to do, I'm not here to enforce the righteous decrees of God over your life and to tell you how, how um, I'm, not, I'm not here to impose myself on you, but this culture that we're living in is now being imposed on us. And true freedom doesn't exist to have the conversation without them trying to turn righteous preachers into 
zealous bigots. Please hear me. If the word of God is true, and I believe it is, there is no where in it for those in that community to be able to say, I am both this and saved. This is tough. I am both this and saved. You can be that and you have that freedom. You do not have the ability to rewrite this book and to tell people. And let me just keep going here. I'm not just talking to the LGBTQ community. I'm talking to heterosexual people sleeping in the bed with folk that you're not married to. I'm talking to heterosexual people that take their iPhone out every now and then and jump on a site that your wife or husband would not permit you to see and fulfilling your sexual fantasies. So here we go, we're making everyone mad. The Bible doesn't say that this generation gets a free pass because of how sexually explicit and how easily available sexually explicit material is. We're living in the most accessible age in history. You can get in touch with sexually explicit material now easier than you can any generation that's ever lived on the planet. And God does not say, that's okay, y'all. I'm gonna give y'all a pass because of how hard it is. No, he doesn't do that. You know what he does? He sweetens the reward. He says, you know what? I know you're living, God, I feel some grace happening right here. I know you're in the most sexually explicit generation that's ever walked the planet. But if you run to me, I'm gonna pour out my spirit in a way on your generation that no other generation, I'm gonna give you more grace, I'm gonna give you more strength, I'm gonna give you more victory, I'm gonna make your pursuit of my presence worth it. If you'll just turn in my direction, if you'll just look to me, I'm gonna make you forget all that other fraudulent intimacy and oh God, I'm gonna satisfy the longing of your soul. Just look in my direction. Say respect purity. And then we move from Respecting purity, and, and, and if you're not careful, you'll start neglecting purity. <laughs> neglecting purity. This is what I would call the traps. If respecting purity is honoring the truth, then neglecting purity is falling into the trap. And it is amazing at how pandemic Sexual impurity has become. Say traps. Traps, listen to me very carefully. If you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not, start taking notes and write this down. Traps are present where truth has been distorted and temptation is present. People fall into a trap when two things happen. Truth has been distorted and temptation shows up knocking. God wants us to live without falling into the trap. You ready for this? You can live without falling into the trap. Well, I just have this deep flaw. No, you keep making the same choice. Jesus, help me here. I hope you understand before you ever get deliverance, you have to take ownership. Well, this is, this is you know, my mama did this to me. My Sunday school teacher did that to me and it made me, I understand that we're gonna pray for pain to be healed in just a few moments. We're gonna pray for God to heal generational things in just a few moments, but I wanna tell you something. Decisions are made every day in your heart and in mine, and we will live and eat the fruit of those decisions. 
And when we stand before Abba and we stand before Jesus, there will be no blaming anyone else for the sin we decided to commit. That's heavy, I know. So I asked my dad to help me today. Always one in every crowd. So I asked my dad to help me today. I talk, to, talk about my dad all the time. He's, he's an expert fisherman. He knows how to do it. He's been doing it for a very long time. Got him a fishing buddy over there, Brother Raymond. Got him a fishing buddy. They've been fishing. And, oh, yeah. This is, uh, Dad, you could have fixed it for me. There it is. This is, uh, oh, great. This is called a topwater lure. Is that right, Dad? This is a topwater lure. I, I know a pretty good bit about fishing. Everything I know about fishing, I learned from my dad. Back in the summers, we used to fish. I mean, like three times a week, get in the boat and go fishing. I remember this lure. You throw this lure up against the bank, just off the rocks, just barely, and you just let it sit there and just bob it like that a few times. Pull on it, make it bounce. It just floating on top of the water. And you would sit there and you would think, man, I ain't catching nothing. If you let it sit there, sit there long enough, there's this big bass laying in the shallow water waiting to see what that thing's going to do. And you just bounce it every now and then and it would lure that bass out of its little, what is it called, Dad? House. Something. Okay, whatever. It had a house. <laughs> In my story, it had a house, okay? The fish had a house. A nest, okay, that was even crazier. All right, so you just, you just lay the lure and you just bounce it a little bit. Let it sit. Pull on a little bit. Let it sit. And I can't tell you how many times throughout my life in the summer, watching a big bass swell up on a topwater lure, inhale it, and my dad go to screaming. <laughs> this is it! <laughs> this is it. Whenever you ask my dad how big the fish was, he always tells the story like the man who caught a fish but only had one arm. How big was it? <laughs> Huge, right? Here's the deal. Satan knows what to put on the end of the line to bounce and just let it sit there and bounce and let it sit there until it pulls you and pulls, tries to pull us out of a place of sanctified righteous living. And here's the thing, y'all. My dad has fish hanging on the wall in his house that used to be alive, but today are trophies because they thought they could take the bait and escape the hook. Listen to me. You might not even be able to see the hook back there where you're sitting, but I'm looking at this bait right here. It has six hooks, two treble hooks attached to it. And if you go looking, oh God, don't let me say that. Whoop. <laughs> if you go looking and trying to get this bait, <laughs> you'll bite it thinking you have the bait, but you'll wind up recognizing the bait has you. I stay away from the trap? 
Well, let me help you understand something. You and I will never live in this world and not be exposed to traps. The deal is, do you know how to stay out of the trap that was set? There's only one way. Stay in love with the one who makes you forget about the bait. If you ever look into his eyes, sir, her eyes. Oh, y'all didn't hear me. Y'all didn't hear me. Y'all didn't hear me. If you ever look into his eyes, her eyes, sir, his eyes, ma'am, they won't pull you into a mess. I'm going to tell you something right now. I love everybody enough to tell you this. Adultery is a sin. The Bible said in the book of Proverbs that the way of the adulteress is like a deep pit. Men fall into it and don't, sometimes they never recover and jump out of it. I'm not being mean or critical because I'm thankful that there have been many that fell into that pit that Jesus rescued and Jesus brought freedom to. How many can thank God for that? I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, that that bait, you might think you're going to get it. Be careful that it doesn't get you. It destroys you. It destroys families. It destroys ministry. Lord, see how this thing is? It just, it's what it does to you. Makes you look like a fool. The trap is set. It's set at your office. It's set on your computer. It's set on your cell phone. I want you today to make up your mind that not just you don't want that, you want him. Sexual sin, Paul says, and I'm wrapping up. Sexual sin, Paul says, is a sin against your own body. Do you understand that what he's saying there? You are inflicting pain on your own self. How is that, Pastor? It feels so good. (laughs) For a moment. Just a minute. Ask yourself how good you feel when that high leaves you and the shame breaks in on you. You know what I like? I like that scripture over in Hebrews about Joseph that said he would not, he would not engage in sin though it had pleasure for a season. Hear me, please. I'm not being funny when I say this, but it's true. Sexual pleasure is very temporary. True intimacy lasts forever. That's why the Bible said beauty is fleeting. Beauty is fleeting. Have you ever thought about that? People get, people get married simply out of sexual attraction, and many times it doesn't last. Because the first time, something starts sagging. I know y'all can't handle this, but it's true. It's like, wait a minute, why'd we get married? You got married for more than that. So let me say it like this. Respect the truth. Don't neglect the truth. Don't fall into a trap. When you hear people telling you, it's okay to do this stuff, it's okay to do that, it's okay to try, try out partners, do you know what you're, and I've heard people come to me in marriage counseling, I'm counseling them, trying to get them married, premarital counseling, and he says, 
we need to experiment. No, you don't. No, you don't. You don't need to, well, what if we don't like it? You will. It's going to be fine. You're going to really enjoy it. I don't know if, you know, we're comp- you're compatible. Trust me. It's a her and a him. It's going to work. But you don't want to build your marriage on that sheer excitement and sheer sexual attraction. Because let me help you understand something. You're going to be doing more than having sex. Like paying bills. Y'all don't want me to go down this road. Let me walk around here and talk. Paying bills. Changing diapers. Sending kids to college. Putting gas in car. Y'all don't like this part. Building a family. You will do more than simply live on a honeymoon. You better make sure you get connected to somebody that walks by faith. I ain't got nothing wrong with being attracted to the, you got to be attracted to the person you marry. You should not marry anybody that repulses you. Come on, family. I mean, you need, sir, you need to think your wife is fine and wife, you need to think your husband is all down the bag of potato chips, right? Come on. But it's more than that. Don't fall for the trap. Can I just say this and move on? It's heavy as a pastor carrying the concern for your people. You say, you shouldn't worry about it. It's their life. They got to make the decision. No, that ain't how pastoring works. I don't want to see somebody ruin their life, their witness, wreck their family all over something temporary. And the good news is, you don't have to. I'm going to end with the greatest news of all. If you have fallen into the trap, like many of us in this room have at some point in their life, not only do you need to protect purity and not only do you need to respect purity and not only do you need to stop neglecting purity, you can redirect toward purity. If you have lost your way, if you feel like you are a mess and in a mess and created the mess, I want to tell you there is hope for you today. If you have struggled with homosexuality, I don't care how long you struggled with it, you can be free. There are people in this church that are a part of this family that will testify you can be free. Now, if you're going to argue with me about it, about, well, I can be this and still be a Christian. No, you can't, and you don't want freedom. You want permission, and the Bible ain't going to give it to you, and neither am I. I ain't doing it. Well, I'll go find a church that'll tell me it's okay. I love you, and when you come to the truth, you can come back to this church and talk to me about it because there is no place in that Bible that permits people to live and accept that life of sin. And likewise, there is no place in that Bible for us to say it is okay. When Paul says, let me end with this, when Paul says, free yourself from sexual immorality, that word sexual immorality in the Greek, it's not two words, it's one, and it's pornea. It's the broadest word he could use in the Greek language to address all and every kind of sexual sin. You know why I appreciate Paul saying that word? He doesn't just point one thing out. He said, all of it. It don't matter if it's a heterosexual sin, a homosexual sin. It doesn't matter how big or what. If it's sexual at all and it is sexual activity outside the confines of marriage, it is immorality and it is a sin. And here's the good news. Aaron, if you'll come help me. You can redirect back toward purity. I'm going to say it like this. You can get your purity back. Amen. 
You say, Pastor Kevin, can I get, I'm gonna be blunt and very clear. Can I, can I get my virginity back? No, but you can get your purity back. Don't let the enemy beat you up over losing your virginity and keep you from pursuing your purity. Because purity comes when the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses the soul, washes the sin. How do I get there, Pastor? To freedom and forgiveness. I tell you how there's only one way. You gotta redirect. Turn your back on the sin. And turn your heart to the Lord. And this can be found in John's gospel. Remember that, sister? It wasn't that somebody told on her for having a sexually immoral encounter. They caught her in the act. I read theologians and historians this past week that believe they drug her into the court of judgment without clothes on. That's what the enemy wants you to feel, the shame. Like the whole world knows. Well, first of all, the whole world don't know your mess. And the better news is it doesn't matter how many people know because one encounter, Jesus, can wash every bit of it away. Redirect this morning back toward purity. Make up your mind. You're not going to keep falling for the same lure. You say, Pastor, I've screwed up so many times. It's just who I am. I came to break that lie in the name of Jesus. A just man or a just woman falls down seven times, but Proverbs says they get back up again. I don't know how many times you may have fallen, but I know what today is. It's a day of getting up for somebody. Somebody is not going home with that label on your life. I get this all the time. Can I come to this church if I'm this? I want you to hear me. You can come to this church however you are because the only place a person in bondage will ever get freedom is in a house that loves people and loves Jesus. You can come to this church however you are. You come as you are. I just don't believe you'll have to stay as you are. Transformation is happening. Paul says, when I was a child, I operated like a child. I functioned as a child and I did childish things. But when I become a man, I had to put that stuff away. Somebody's got to grow up today. We all had to. And you just got to say, that whole struggle, I don't care if it was a 10-year struggle, a five-year struggle, a one-night struggle, a 20-year struggle, there comes a point in your life when you have to look back and say, that was then. That's not who I am moving forward. You can be free. The woman is drugged into the court of judgment and they all have stones and they look at Jesus and they say, what are we gonna do with her? We caught her in the act. That's what religion will do to you right there. Religion is so maniacal, it'll make you break the law trying to find someone else who's broken it. They had to go look on the nudity of a woman who was having an illicit sexual encounter. They actually had to sin themselves by finding someone in sin. Y'all missed that. How do you know what she was doing? Well, we were there. Well, you shouldn't have been, Mr. Religion. They drug her in and said, we caught her. Got stones here. What you want us to do? 
Ready for this? You know what he does? Something none of us would have had the brains to do. He bent over in the ground and started writing stuff. And somebody said, oh, oh, pastor, I want to know what did he write in the ground? You ready for this? It ain't none of your business. Everybody wants to talk about what he wrote in the ground. Nobody knows. You know why? It wasn't about us. It was to her. Aren't you glad he don't tell all your business? And he stands up and the only righteous one in the room is Jesus. And he looks at all those with stones and says, you who are without any sin, let it rip. Cast the first stone. Take her out. The only one who had no sin was Jesus. Everyone else had sin. And the only one who had the qualification to throw the first stone told the rest of them to drop theirs. So if you're righteous and you're holy, your righteousness and holiness and your purity before God are not an invitation for you to pick up stones and finish off those who've fallen. You ought to come to the rescue of those who are in misery and help restore them. So I want to pray today. I want to pray today for people who feel the condemnation and the shame of failure. I want to pray for people today who need yokes to be destroyed and they want to live a sanctified life, but they feel like the fight is so heavy they don't know how. I, I know this sounds a little funny, but I'm not trying to be. I want to pray for young people who are in the throes of hormonal passion. Do you know what Psalm 105 says about that? How shall a young man cleanse his way? <laughs> He's asking the right question. Because all the people in here, all them brothers in here that was young at one time, you know. Come on. Woo! I'm on fire! I'm a hunk of hunk of burning love! How do I get this under control? How? That's what he's saying. Psalm 105. How shall a young man cleanse his way? Only one way. Not more willpower, but by loving the Word of God. It's not that I don't, let me say it this way. It's not that I think you love sexual sin. I think you hate it. I just think there's room for you and I to love him more. And if we'll turn to him and love him more, we'll love that much less. Friend, I believe God is speaking to hearts right now. This message, I pray, has stirred you. And there are some who are watching this message who are waiting on the opportunity to give their heart to Jesus Christ. Listen, the greatest day in your life is the day that you give your heart to Jesus Christ and allow him to become the Lord of your life. And if you want that opportunity, then right now I wanna pray with you. You know, the Bible says in the book of Acts that God commands men and women everywhere to repent, to turn from their sin, and to turn to the living God. And the message of hope today for you is that no matter how messed up you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how far away from God you feel, He is only one prayer away. Would you turn your heart toward Him right now? Just say, dear God, save me, forgive me, cleanse me of my sin, and make me new. I, I confess you as my Lord and Savior, Jesus, and I'm asking you to be the King of my heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, friend, if you prayed that prayer, let us know today. We want to make sure you have a Bible. We want to make sure you know that as a local church here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, someone is praying for you. We hope to see you soon if you're in the Chattanooga area. And if not, get in a Bible-believing church somewhere and grow in your purpose in Christ. We love you. We're praying for you today. God bless you.